God is a God of patterns. Please look up. God is a God of patterns. And usually, continuity in the spirit and in the kingdom is based on the capture of the patterns that are responsible for certain occurrences. You read from the book of Genesis chapter 1 that everything God created, he didn't have to create it the second time again. Are, are we together now? That every time he would create something, he would weave within that creation a pattern for the continuity of that process. So if you wanted to see a repetition of certain things, all you needed to do was to capture the pattern. In architecture, if I want to reproduce this structure right now, say in London or in, in Abuja or in, in um, you know, UK or anywhere, I don't need to come and carry the building. In fact, I do not even need to be here physically. Is that true? What I need is the pattern. The pattern can, with exactitude and precision, grant me the understanding, architecturally speaking, to reproduce this structure to an extent that if you were blindfolded and carried away to the other structure and they open you up, you would not even know you are transited. That is how powerful and predictable patterns are. Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 6. The glory, the manifestation of the glory of God upon the life of an individual is dependent on our ability to walk in keeping with divine patterns. Here's what he told Moses. 9, 6 Leviticus. This is the thing, he says, which the Lord commanded that ye should do and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. That means the glory would not just come because you desire to come. It responds to certain things that you need to do. Hallelujah. So there are patterns that are allotted for certain spiritual occurrences. For instance, you can verify if a believer has been saved by asking him what pattern he followed is that true because according to romans chapter 10 from verse 8 down to 10 and then extends to 15 the bible says the pattern for the administration of the life of god into the spirit of a believer is that you must believe with your heart the lord jesus am i right on that and then that with your mouth confession is made even unto salvation that is the pattern that with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When it has to do with the healing of bodies and all of that, the pattern is that number one, there has to be the hearing of faith. Is that true? Yes. The hearing of faith in partnership with the anointing is what would produce that outcome. So, all of the outcomes that we desire in our lives, we, we are helped by God to achieve those desires by the revelation of the patterns that control those results. Church growth has a pattern. Financial prosperity has a spiritual pattern. Are we together? So, your maturity in the spirit is not just measured by your longevity in church, but your ability to have, through the ministry of the spirit and a teaching priest, access the various patterns that control the outcomes of your life. You gain mastery in spiritual things to the degree to which you have pieced together these patterns. Now you can become a blessing because with a doctor's level of precision, when you see someone, you know what pattern they are missing. Immediately, without ambiguity, you can tell them, this is what you are missing. When Satan came to attack Peter, Jesus knew what to do. He rebuked him and he said, Peter, Satan had desired to shift you like wheat, but... The pattern for your deliverance is, I have prayed for you. So every time believers are afflicted, the pattern that is responsible, connected to that deliverance, is prayer. James 5.13, is anyone afflicted? He says, let him pray. Are we learning now? Yeah. So it's important for us to understand spiritual patterns and 
This morning, very briefly, we want to consider the pattern. What spiritual pattern is responsible for growth and stature in the spirit? What do I need to engage to evolve into superior spiritual dimensions? Because it looks like many believers struggle with the subject of growth and maturity and stature in the spirit and sadly many have been around you know the house of God for many years but you cannot based on the biblical indices that measure maturity you cannot say they have attained unto maturity and Galatians 4 says an heir for as long as that heir is a child he says he differed not from a servant or a slave are we blessed? There is a pathway that if and when you follow, the result is that you must be matured. You will be a person of stature in the spirit. And like we always discuss, there are certain dimensions of your spiritual inheritance you cannot be given until your maturity matches the level to which you are able to manage that gift. The same way a responsible parent would not give a child of 10 years old or 5 years old car keys. Not because you do not love the child. His level of maturity cannot support that blessing. So we are unable to walk in certain levels of authority in the spirit experientially. We keep reading in the Bible that we should walk in those levels. But experientially speaking, we are unable to because it takes touch up to receive certain mantles. It takes touch up to walk in certain levels of the anointing. If you're with me, please say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to Acts chapter 6 and from verse 1 to 4. The early church is a template for us to be able to follow. The Bible says, and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Why? Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministrations. We're reading to 4. Verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitudes of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. What level of focus and discipline and diligence. This already, I can stop in verse 2 and that can be a message for men of God. Be careful with growth. Growth is able to distract you from what brought the growth in the first place. Legitimately so. It is not only sin that distracts men. Results can distract. Here is multiplication happening. And they are telling them, listen, you need to pause what you are doing and manage a situation here. But they said, listen, 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 we, we are not going to be distracted. We will set up a system to protect our focus. Verse 3. Give us verse 3, we're still here. It says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Can you imagine the requirement in the Bible for being in the welfare department? How in the world do you make this kind of laborious requirement to serve tables? You needed discernment, wisdom, full of honest report. Of course, honest report. You are serving people. I understand honest reports, but full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we, this is the pattern. It was given to us by Jesus himself. If we are desirous of growth and continuity, he says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Pay attention now. Here the apostles reveal a very powerful secret that was behind their level of growth and maturity. Did you know that all through their time with Jesus, this was all that happened? Prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer and the ministry of the word. It transited these gentlemen from timid confused 
some visionless men into mighty apostles of the Lamb. He called them to be with him. And while they were with him, he introduced a spiritual pattern. Now the apostles had kept this pattern. The ministry of the word and prayer. Are we learning already? Hmm. But then, I hope that God will help me to be able to bridge a very serious gap. Pastor, I believe that is widening in the body of Christ and creating lopsidedness and imbalance knowing then that the ministry of the word and of prayer are the principal patterns that have been given to the believer for growth it seemed like something happened through history that diverged people to now begin to choose the ministry of the word or prayer are we together now so the dichotomy has been created between the prayer ministry and then the word ministry so we have classically speaking and now I'm, I'm speaking from a standpoint of love and this to the body of Christ we have people who would want to brand themselves as prayer people and that is wonderful and profitable then we have those who would want to brand themselves as word people and this has created a lot of confusion because both sides have results now if one side is completely failing it becomes obvious that you are missing something it is difficult to correct a person that has results you see failure provokes change it breaks your pride and humbles you you come to a point where you acknowledge that truly i need help but how do you help a person who has results you find that in Acts chapter 18 from verse 24. The Bible speaks about a very intelligent man called Apollos of Alexandria. Please give it to us. The Bible says this man was an eloquent man. Look at the credentials of this man. He was mighty in scripture. The Bible says he came to Ephesus. We are reading to 28. The next verse. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. So he submitted himself to mentorship. The Bible says he was fervent in spirit and he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. What more would you require from a man? But he knew only. Knowing only. You can have all of this and yet know only. Fervent in spirit, mentored, built, knowing only. 26. The Bible says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. One day, two strange people were in his conference. I'm telling you, I learned this early ministry. You must be aware that you are not impressing everybody. There are, while you are ministering the word, there are people standing from an elevated altitude in the spirit. Just because they are listening to you does not mean they are helpless. There are people who, this is what happened in this case. Please give us that scripture. This guy was ministering, shouting, preaching with fire like I'm doing now. And there were two strange people in that conference. They sat quietly listening to the only that he knew. Aquila and Priscilla. The Bible says when they heard him, they commended him. I like them. They didn't discourage him. But then they took him unto them and read with me. Expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly more perfectly the danger of knowing only this is the reason why we must brace ourselves with humility I have profound regard and respect especially for great people whose hearts are open to learn I am very vocal when I find things I do not know I'm very I don't I don't tolerate ignorance in my life my heart is ever open to learn because God gave me this revelation and it brought me deliverance. Sometimes you can be so vibrant, but knowing only. Could this have been a message for someone? Thank God for what you have seen, but could it be that you know only? So let this year be the year that God will bring prophetic midwives. Listen to what I'm telling you. Like Aquila and Priscilla, who would help you 
and expound to you the way of the Lord more perfectly. Let's go back to our discussion. So I was talking about the dichotomy. There has been supposedly one group that places an emphasis on prayer and all the supporting spiritual exercises that come with prayer like fasting and some other things but may seem to subliminally or even vocally downplay the ministry of the word then respectfully speaking on on the other hand we have people who exalt the word they demonstrate clearly the supremacy of the word and may seem to not pay attention to the ministry of prayer and all the supporting spiritual exercises that accompany prayer hallelujah and you see all these sites have their consequences the key is to study Jesus. I told us yesterday that there are four biblical channels for knowing God. Let me recap. Number one, I said scripture. The Holy Scripture is one of the biblical pathways by which we know God. Is that true? Number two is the names of God. The names of God are a capture of the various dimensions of him that were revealed to men. Every time God revealed new dimensions of himself, it will be captured in a name so that when you want to see that dimension, you study the revelation behind that name. The third way we know God is through the revelation of Jesus. The Bible calls him the express image of the invisible God. And then number four, like Job taught us, is experience. I have heard with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. So let's study Jesus for a few minutes. And let's see how Jesus brings with precision the balance between the ministry of prayer and of the word. Is someone learning? In the book of Luke chapter 2, I'll begin my reading from 41. Luke 2, 41. It's a long reading. Please be patient. This is teenager Jesus now in the flesh. The Bible says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Uh -huh. When he was 12 years old, the Bible says they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Next verse. And when they had fulfilled the days, they returned. The child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey. And when they sought among him, among the acquaintances, they did not find him, 45. The Bible says, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. There's a reason why I started from there. The Bible says, and it came to pass, after three days they found him where? In the temple. Everybody say the word. So we see from the life of Jesus, his passion to stay, to learn, to grow. Did you know that many of the things he was learning, his coming was even to abolish some of them. And yet, even as the word incarnate, he submitted himself to that learning. Please give us that scripture. Let's finish up. They found him sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Next verse. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dwelt with, dealt with us? Behold, thy father has sought thee sorrowing. All right? And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Two more verses. And they understood not the sayings which he spake. The Bible says, and he went down to them with, to Nazareth, and now verse 52, the verse that we know, and Jesus increased. Usually this is where we read, but we do not know how he increased. I took that journey to show you that he did not increase just because he was the son of God. He submitted himself to learning and to doctrine. So we see his respect for prayer to the extent that he... It was even affecting his relationship with his parents in the flesh. He was that determined and he called that his father's business. Mark chapter 1. We'll read from verse 21 to 28. Mark 
chapter 1. Watch this now. This is Jesus. And they went to Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue. Verse, next verse. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. One more time, please say doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, Jesus? So you see that Jesus grew in the word had doctrine with proof because exousia, the word that is translated authority, is derived from the strength of your understanding of the word. There are four words that are used to express power and authority. Two of them are largely known in the body of Christ, dunamis and exousia. Exousia is a product of your the depth of your comprehending the ways and the principles of God. It translates to authority. It legitimizes your ability to now stand in the office of the Christ and to administer authority. Are we together? I hope you know that authority is what gives legitimate ground for the use of power. You can have power, but authority is what makes the administration of power legitimate. Hallelujah. You can have a gun. That is power. But one person can shoot it and will clap for him. That is authority. Another person can shoot it and end up in jail. Are we together now? Yeah. It's not enough to have power. You must have authority. And that comes by growth. It comes through your comprehending the word. Let's finish that scripture, please. Verse 25 now, very quickly. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace, come out of him. Next verse. And when the unclean spirit had turned him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. What was the result? The Bible says they were all amazed in that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, they acknowledged the authority that came from the word, commanded he even the unclean spirit, and they do obey him. And immediately, on account of the word, his fame spread abroad to all the regions. Please jump to verse 32 for sake of time. I want you to follow patiently. I'm trying to establish Jesus as the pattern that brings the balance of prayer and the ministry of the word. Now we have seen the ministry of the word in his life and the corresponding results that followed. The Bible says, verse 32, and at evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. Uh -huh. And all the city was gathered together at the door. He healed many who were sick of divers diseases, casting out many devils, and he suffered not them to speak. Verse 35. The Bible says, and in the morning, with such phenomenal results, and in the morning, many of us would not go back to the ministry of prayer again. I took time to detail these results from the dexterity of his, his, his communication of doctrine to the results, the miracles, manifestation of authority, healing, signs, and wonders. Now, the Bible says that while it was early in the morning, rising up a great while before day please help me he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed and there prayed and there prayed so he was not just sound in doctrine we see his commitment and his discipline to the ministry of prayer is someone learning Matthew chapter 4 probably gives the most, in my opinion, the most intelligent theological defense that attempts to bridge the gap between the dichotomy that has been created between the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. I repeat that for many people, um, because of the results that come from the ministry of the word, we may not seem to immediately see the necessity for a rich and a robust prayer life. Not as a system of managing emergencies, but as a lifestyle. 
And then for people who are inclined to prayer, because of the spiritual blessings that come from the place of prayer, they might not need to endure sound doctrine to now learn. Because you see, it takes time to be matured by the word. You can pray in one hour. You can't grow in the word in one hour. It will take time. The Bible talks about men enduring sound doctrine. Are we together? So let's look at Matthew chapter 4, please. Again, I request that you pay attention. Just lend me your attention and let's patiently understand something as we pray. Matthew 4 verse 1. This is what we call the temptation of Jesus. Follow closely. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. So we see the ministry of the Spirit at work in the life of this Jesus. We're not in doubt as to his submission to the ministry of the Spirit. The next verse, please. Verse 2. The Bible says, when he had fasted, of course, that went with prayer. Forty days and forty nights. Afterwards, he was hungry. So we see that he went to the wilderness by the leadership of the Spirit. We see that he got to the wilderness. He prayed and fasted forty days. You know the level of spiritual stamina it takes to stretch like that? We are not talking of fasting and breaking in the night. 40 days, 40 nights, as much as we know, we did not see any food or anything there given to him. Now, when that was done, verse 3, when the tempter came, my God, may God open your eyes to see something here now. When the tempter came, the tempter met the man who had the word and prayer. The tempter met the man who had the word and prayer the tempter met the man who had the word and prayer watch this and he said to him if thou be the son of god command these stones that they be made bread look at the reply of jesus everybody please read with me but he answered and said it is stop did he say i prayed did he say i fasted what was his answer? But what was he doing in the wilderness? Prayer and fasting. You thought that when he met the devil, he would say, are you, in fact, shouldn't you be afraid that the prayer and fasting of Jesus brought Satan closer to him? Hmm. <laughs> you would think that after praying and fasting for 40 days, led by the Spirit, should Satan be able to stand such a man? I leave it to you to use your mind. The make believe that just because you are praying and fasting arbitrarily, Satan will run away. It's just a consolation, believe me. And I know what I'm saying. This is Jesus, except you don't believe the Bible. Jesus, the word incarnate, immersed himself in the word, now prayed, not before the prayer, not during. He was done praying 40 days with fasting and Satan shows up. No shaking, no falling, no fear. And he says, you are hungry. Don't deny it. You are hungry. He's talking to Jesus and he's saying, use the power you have gotten from your prayer and fasting. Turn stone to bread. And Jesus looked at him and said, it is written. Please look up. If Jesus had prayer and did not have the word, he will fall over that temptation the same way someone who did not pray and fast for 40 days. His not knowing scripture would have aborted the potency of his fasting and prayer. If you were to raise Jesus who had spent time praying and fasting and someone who did not even pray, both of them would have fallen over the same temptation. His basis for security was it is written. Please give us that scripture. First temptation. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Now look at Satan. You see, Satan is every other thing but foolish. Don't add foolishness to your description of Satan. You'll be wrong. Hallelujah. The devil took him to a holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if thou be the son of God. Now watch this. The ministry of prayer is about to come in now. 
Satan said, oh, I see that you are grounded in the word. So let's go to it is written now. For it is, did Satan also say it is written? So if all that Jesus had was it is written without discernment, he would fall like a pack of cards. The moment he demonstrated supremacy to the world, Satan also switched. That means I will not make my temptation so obvious. I will use things that are scriptural. So I took you to a holy temple. Since I spoke about carnal things, your belly, now I see you are spiritual. Let's talk about spiritual things. I also know it is written. This is where the discernment and the stamina that comes from prayer now helps you to survive. Is someone learning now? Please give it to us. It is written, he shall keep his angels. Look at the accuracy of quoting this scripture. He shall keep his angels charge over you. You see, let me tell you. The truth can also destroy. Just because it is the truth does not mean it will bless you. The truth must be rightly divided and accurately communicated. This statement you see, watch this now, was not a lie. Satan was quoting verbatim, but the basis of that quotation was the Bible called the entire process temptation. And yet scripture was part of the tools that were used for that temptation. So when Satan tries lost or he tries stealing and he say, no, I am a child of God. He tries church. He tries a lot of other things too. This is where the stamina that comes from the place of prayer and the ability to discern and perceive. If you are using physical results to gauge whether a thing is of God or of the devil, you will fall like a pack of cards. There are many good things that were designed to kill you. Sometimes Satan can use even compassion to destroy you. Is someone learning? He used Peter's compassion. What, did Pete, what was Peter's offense that Jesus rebuked Satan from him? Trying to refute him from going to the cross. That was compassion. And he said, get behind me, Satan. And Peter said, what did I do? He said, Peter, Satan has desired. It's not only evil. Remember, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were all part of one tree. Good and evil come from one tree. The other tree is life, not good, not evil. So be careful with good things. They are connected to the same tree. What Jesus came to give us is not good. He came to give us life. We look to Yahweh, Yahweh. is Yahweh Yahweh we look to Yahweh Yahweh forever Yahweh is someone learning in this service so here we see Jesus teaching us the various roles that the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word play as far as defending you and securing the manifestation of the life of God that is in you. To the one who has downplayed the relevance of the ministry of prayer, you are making a wrong step. And eventually, the tempter has a way of navigating through your weakness until he brings you down. To one who has de-emphasized the supremacy of the word of God, I'll be wrapping up by showing you the assignment of prayer and the assignment of the word of God in the life of a believer. Most people do not know what prayer was meant for and what the ministry of the word of God, what does it achieve? Seeing that it is a pattern for growth and stature, when I submit myself to the ministry of prayer, what happens to me? What are the dimensions of the relevance of prayer in my life? Why should I submit to prayer and then submit to the word? I'm hoping that by this teaching, God will bring a, a serious deliverance for a person, a ministry to say, listen, 
we need to be able to capture the whole counsel of God. Not to ignore the ministry of prayer. Not to ignore the ministry of the word. Hallelujah. This is very powerful. So the second temptation, he took him and Jesus said, it is written again. The third temptation, the Bible says he took him into an exceeding high mountain and that he showed him the glories, the kingdoms of the world. This is another discussion for another day. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you know by now you are an intelligent church that is full of the word. You know that it's not just an elevated altitude there. No, where he took him to this location is a spiritual location. Where do you stand upon that you see the glories of the world? It's not a mountain. He took him into and showed him. He says, all have been given to me. Jesus did not say it's a lie because Adam gave him. He said, bow down to me. When the Bible tells you what shall it profit a man when he gains the whole world, that mountain is the place of that business. You don't sell products there. It's a transaction between your soul and the world. And many people have been taken to that mountain till today. There is a threshold level of success you cannot attain until you pledge your allegiance clearly to one of these governments. It's like a spiritual meter. The devil is watching you. When you strike that chord, here they come. There has to be a system of negotiating your soul. Yes, sir. When you read Revelations 19, I wish we had time. That harlot that rides upon the horse having the blood of the Matthias. Are we together now? When you read the many things that she sells, you will see there that she sells the souls of men. That's where she got the souls of men. Those who came to exchange their souls. That's why the apostle said, I desire, I wish above all things that he prosper, but that while you prosper, ensure that your soul also prospers. So I can vet the basis of your prosperity by checking the condition of your soul while you rise. If you are losing your touch with God as your wealth is increasing, your fraternity is with Babylon. We don't clap for people for being prosperous in the kingdom until we ascertain the state of their soul. If we find out that the higher your glory increases, whether financially speaking, your life is going down, you need to go for a retreat and vet who is sponsoring those possibilities. Because Satan will never allow you to rise as your soul prospers. No. It is the reason why the principles of prosperity for a believer is very different for an unbeliever and does not make sense because until we explain the side effect of being of prospering the world's way, there is no obvious side effect except we check from the realm of the spirit. Are we together? Yeah. So, what is the assignment of prayer? Let me wrap up. What is the assignment of prayer? I want to make a statement that I hope will not be misunderstood. Prayer is not the only key in the kingdom. There are keys of the kingdom. There is one key to the kingdom, Jesus. And then when you come into the kingdom, there are many keys of the kingdom. Prayer is a foundational, fundamental key but it is an error to believe that prayer is the only key in the kingdom. Prayer must be involved in every process of the kingdom. But it is not the only key. Are we clear on that? It is true. If you come into a house, you come through the main door, which is Jesus. There are rooms in that house. Is that true? If you have the key to the restroom alone, you'll be in trouble when you are hungry. Because you have the key to, you are in the house. We are not doubting it. But now you are hungry and the only key you have is to the restroom. Or if you have the key to the kitchen alone, if you need to use the restroom, the key to the kitchen, as potent as it is, may not help you. So he gave us the keys. The keys. Are we learning now? Yes. One of the fundamental major keys of the kingdom is the ministry of prayer. I needed to say that 
Um, I'm a man of prayer, so you, you know that. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it at all. But it is important to bring us, it is such revelations that have made us downplay all sin. I wonder what Jesus was teaching them that even after he resurrected, he said, get back, let's continue the lecture for 40 days. What else was he teaching them? If he was the ministry of the word, he had taught them. If he was prayer, he had taught them. So what else was he teaching them? Until the church embraces the entire counsel of God, we will not attain unto a state of maturity. So you see various versions of lopsidedness in the body of Christ, which are a testament to the fact that we have ignored, ignored certain dimensions, maybe sincerely. This is why God put conferences like this, to be able to bring to speed and bring us to a point of balance. So that, you see, when you read Revelations, he said, come and I will show you the lamb's wife. He said, he showed me a city that was equal in length, equal in depth, equal in height. No imbalance. That is the lamb's wife. Are we together? So, when it comes to the ministry of prayer, you are robust on fire. When it comes to the ministry of the word and all the other dimensions of the kingdom. This is why he gave unto some apostles and prophets. Is that true? Evangelists, teachers and all of that for the maturing of the saints. That the saints now being matured will do the work of the ministry. Let's finish up. What is the assignment of prayer? I will not be teaching, but I will just list it. Just for us to know. In addition to all we have heard from the great and amazing men and the women of God that God has brought, including that which we heard from God's servant this morning. What is the assignment of prayer in the life of the believer? I have studied my Bible and I'm, I'm still a student learning, but I have found four principal assignments that the ministry of prayer accomplishes in the life of the believer. Number one, the first assignment of prayer that the Bible reveals is for transformation. Luke chapter 9 and verse 29, the Bible speaking about Jesus again, our pattern man. He said, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. The principal assignment of prayer is not even for petitions. It is a tool that was given to help you evolve to superior spiritual dimensions. Show me a believer that just came into Christ and let that person submit himself through methodical mentorship to the ministry of prayer. I show you a fading version of that man and like the eagle, a new version, a weak you can become a strong you when you pray. A timid you can become a powerful you when you pray. Are we together now? An undiscerning carnal you can become such an individual with high level spirituality when you pray. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, Jesus spoke a parable, the Bible says, to the end that men, not some men, men, provided you are a man, he says that you ought to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says to pray without ceasing. It means to be consistent in your prayer life. Are we together? So the first assignment of prayer is for growth and transformation. Number two, the second assignment of prayer as revealed from scripture is for obtaining requests and for making petitions. The second assignment of prayer to the believer in Christ as revealed from scripture is for obtaining requests and making petitions. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. It says, and what things soever ye desire. Mark, did I get that right? Yes. When ye pray, not if ye pray. It says, believe that ye receive them and thou and ye shall have them. Jesus was speaking and said, He that told you have not asked me anything. He says, Ask that you may receive. Because the law is in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 7. It says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock, it says, and the door shall be opened unto you. I like verse 8. It says, For everyone. There are some things that are for some in the Bible. But when it has to do with the ability to receive through prayer, everyone that asketh, Receiveth. He say, ye have not because ye ask not. Someone say prayer. prayer. Are we learning? 
So number one, for your transformation. Number two, for obtaining requests. Number three, the third assignment of prayer as revealed from scripture is for warfare and intercession. Warfare and intercession. There is a warfare dimension to the believer's life. Paul in giving us his exegesis in the book of Ephesians, the entire six chapters are broken into three, theologically speaking, that teaches the believer to understand, number one, his positional advantage in Christ. Number two, the work of the believer in terms of character. But number three, the ability to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Are we learning now? This is very, very important. Warfare. Jesus did not leave us in the dark as to the fact that the whole world lies in wickedness. Paul was teaching us and he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, he says, but against principalities, powers, is that true? Rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness that reside in the heavenlies. Jesus himself is called the head of all principalities and powers. He didn't deny their existence. In teaching his parable, he said, while men slept, the enemy came. So you are not the only farmer. You sow and another farmer can come and sow something you did not sow. Ezekiel chapter 22, when you read, I think verse 30 now, he said, and I sought for a man. I hope I got that scripture right. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Prayer becomes an instrument, a potent instrument for intercession. You see, the, a, a, a genuine apostolic and prophetic intercessory ministry is founded upon two things. Number one, your love for God and people. Number two, the principle of shared dominion. If you do not love God and people, you cannot truly engage the dimension of warfare and intercession. And then the principle of shared dominion. The Bible says the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, but the earth has he given unto the sons of men. That means nothing happens on earth without the participation of a man. Let them have dominion he said hallelujah I hope that I was still out five minutes from my time this night and will trust God to pray and speak over Nigeria in the mighty name of Jesus Christ hoping and wishing and praying and saying things will change is a joke and don't let anybody laugh at prayer going on because it matters like i said it is not the only key but it is a potent key if we don't pray we're going to be in trouble in fact the cure for temptation the bible says watch and pray that means your mind and your spirit watch there means don't throw your mind away you will need discernment there is an intellectual component to your safety but in addition he said pray so that's number three. Have we been blessed today? <laughs> the fourth assignment of prayer as revealed from scripture is for spiritual legislation. The ability to create possibilities in your life. I'd like you to please pay attention. If it is true that God is creator, the first revelation of God from scripture was not a healer, was as creator. Genesis 1 verse 1, the Bible says, Now the earth was dark, and void is the Hebrew word tohu wabohu, confusion and chaos. And then verse 3, it says, and Elohim, the talking spirit said, light be. Are we together now? And there was, and what he saw was good. So we were created in the image and the likeness of God. And we must also function as talking spirits. The ability to legislate, to create our possibilities. The Bible says in Proverbs, I believe, is it or Job 22, 28, said, Declare ye that thou mightest be justified. Where the word of a king is, thou shalt also decree a thing, yes, and it shall be established unto you. Can I tell you, never downplay the place of confession. But the challenge, and I say this respectfully to the body of Christ, is that, confession without the hovering of the spirit is empty words this is the technology the bible reveals god never spoke until he ascertained that the movement of the spirit had set the atmosphere 
it was the spirit that took Ezekiel. When you read Ezekiel 37 in the valley of the dry bones, please pay attention. The spirit of God took him there. I prophesied as I was commanded. The atmosphere had been created and there was a sound. Most times we just make empty confessions. That's why it does not work. You must ascertain the hovering of the spirit. It's the union of the hovering of the spirit and the spoken word that commands creation. I would learn that practically in a Renhard Bunker crusade many years ago. I was in that crusade. You may have heard my story. Thousands of people and I was standing watching that great man of God. I was also a man of God, but I had to throw all of that. Because you don't receive from colleagues. You must submit yourself. That spiritual potential difference must be there. And he preached a very simple message. Almost annoyingly simple. And while he was done, he was taking a glass of water so that he would now minister the baptism and healing. And the Lord opened my eyes. That was my first visionary encounter of the person of the Holy Spirit. I saw a gigantic bird without exaggeration. It would be as big probably as this auditorium. Just hovering around with some silvery things tied with the wings. It was just soaring. I thought everyone was, what is this? By the time I returned from that vision, sir, I had backed the stage. I was, I was already facing, you know, facing the people while I didn't even know. And that was where the Holy Spirit took me to Genesis 1-2 and said the union of the hovering of the Spirit and the spoken word is what births creation, not just confession. You now understand why the psalmist will say, bring me, or the prophet will say, bring me a mistrail. You even see this pattern. I wish we had time. You would have seen what happened after Saul, the son of Kish, met with prophet Samuel. Are we Bible students? One of, the, one of the signs that he was given was that as you return, number one, restoration had happened. What was missing had now been found. Number two, honor and favor. You will meet three men holding two loaf of bread. They will salute you and give to you. And he says, receive. Then number three, you will come to the garrison of the Philistines and you will see some prophets and they will be holding instruments of music. What were they doing with it walking on the street? It is a law. It's a spiritual law. There is no man I know that works in superior dimensions of the miraculous that does not have an inclination to the atmosphere of worship. Let's wrap up. What then is the assignment of prayer? The assignment of the word. Like prayer, I have found from scripture four principal assignments of the word in the life of the believer. Do not forget what we're discussing this, this, this morning. The patterns that make for growth and for stature. And we identify two principal patterns according to Acts 6.4. The ministry of prayer, the ministry of the word. And my assignment was to help to bridge that gap that age-long divide that has been in the body of Christ, whether you are given the liberty to choose prayer or the word. We are never given any liberty of such according to scripture. So we use Jesus because if we use a prophet or any other person, Jesus is our pattern man. At least God credited him and said, I am well pleased. So if you study Jesus, he is perfect theology. Number one, the first assignment of the word of God is to build the character of Christ in the believer. My apologies, I have to rush. The first assignment of the word of God is to build the character of Christ in the believer. This is what you call transformation. Transformation is the name given to the process that makes you become like Christ in experience. He says, my little children of whom I travail until Christ be formed in you. That formation of Christ is what we call character. Character is not just about resolutions. 
it is something that comes from within you. You will make resolutions and break them until something dies within you. And the assignment of the word of God is to grant you that capacity to evolve. Hallelujah. Number two, the second assignment of the word of God is for the renewal of your mind. The renewal of your mind. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, it says to permit this mind to be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus did not just excel because he was the son of God. There was a mental construct. He had allowed the word of God to build a kind of thinking, an approach to life that gave the Holy Spirit room to do mighty things through him. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, when you read from verse 1 and 2, he says, I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye offer your bodies unto God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. He calls it your reasonable act of worship. Verse 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world. The word world here is the Greek word aeon. It means the thinking pattern that comes with the age. He says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are we together? Number three, what is the third assignment of the word? The word of God is the principal channel for accessing wisdom and understanding. The wisdom that comes from above. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse, uh, should, should that be 15 or so? It says, all scripture, no 15, let's try 15. Did I get that right? Yes, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise. You are made wise. Yes, there is the spirit of wisdom and all of that, but there is the stability. Let me tell you the truth. Honestly, the word of God contains the wisest perspective on all matters. If you submit yourself, when you find people demonstrate certain levels of godlike wisdom beyond that which is affordable as far as our civilization is concerned, it was outsourced from above through the word. The word can make men wise. It can culture your approach to life. It can bring dexterity and order to your life. Are we together? Wisdom and understanding. And finally, the fourth assignment of the word as revealed from scripture is that it empowers us to walk in authority. It empowers us to walk in authority. It empowers us to walk in authority. Everyone, especially in the New Testament and afterwards, who walked in authority, they were men and women of the word. When the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, they thought that they were drunk with new wine, and Peter said no. He stilled them and said, this is that. And he began his exegesis right from Prophet Joel to the psalmist, and he said, this same Jesus whom you have crucified, today he has been exalted as both Lord and Christ. The Bible says when they heard it, they were caught to the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what do we do? And he said, repent for the remission of your sins, and you shall also receive this promise. He says, for this promise is unto you and to your children, your children's children, even to as many as are far off, those that the Lord will call. It is impossible to walk in authority outside of the word. My charge, therefore, is that we we obtain grace from this teaching and all of the teachings before now and after now and submit ourselves to learn respectfully speaking especially if the call of god is on your life whether you have begun ministry or not you never outgrow learning the word of god your authority is a measure of the word of god that is resident within you it is written you may have heard me say is greater than i saw it is written is greater than I heard. No matter what you see and hear, it is written is above it. You can use it is written to rewrite any narrative. So if I wake up and have a negative dream, I saw, but I can use it is written to veto the outcome. Your life is at a risk if all you have is I saw. Your life is at a risk. And you see, prayer helps you to see. Prayer helps you to hear. But I hope you bring that prayer under the dominion of the word. 
because I tell you it is written is greater than I saw. It is written is greater than I heard. I saw, I heard can carry several margins of error based on your level of transformation. When you grow later, you find out what you saw was not correct. But this that is written remains, even in the realm of the spirit. Colossians 1 verse 16, let me wrap up. Exalts the word of God and shows the level, the extent of the dominion of the word of God. He says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth. Visible and invisible. The scope of the impact of the word of God is beyond the visible realm. He says, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. My charge is that we obtain grace from God and bridge the age-long gap. Never watch people praying and say these guys are just prayer, prayer people. They are just fanatics. Be careful because there may be something you are missing. There are many things you will never understand about the realm of the spirit until you submit yourself to extended periods of prayer. Take note of my choice of words. Extended periods of prayer. I submit to you by the integrity of God's word. There are certain realms you may never understand the dynamics of their operation. There are certain levels of the presence, the Shekinah, the manifested presence of God that may never find expression in your life until you submit yourself to prayer with fasting. If I had the time, I would have told you what the fire of prayer does. Because the Bible says when the apostle caught, they fell wood. Remember in the book of Acts, there was a viper hiding there. The viper hid because the wood was so cold. The moment it was lit with fire, the viper that was hiding came out. It is impossible for anything to hide when you are on fire. In fact, Jesus was speaking about the deliverance. He said when a spirit leaves a man, it goes to a desert region. And without anybody casting it from the desert, it will run back to the man because a desert is a hot place. It was, it was just a prophetic message. He meets you cold even though swept and empty. It will gather others and bring there. No matter how mad a man is, he does not enter fire by mistake. And listen, Jesus speaking about prayer said, my house not just the temple he's talking of you shall be called number one hold on hold on he leaves you with two options you are either called a house of prayer or a den of robbers because the thief is there ready to steal so you are either a house of prayer or your coldness makes you a den of robbers he will steal your joy steal your health steal any other thing you are either a house of prayer or a den of robbers I choose to be a house of prayer. But then, I trust God for grace. And we thank God for the remarkable apostolic works that great men like Pastor Pojo are doing across with Wafbeck to be able to bridge the gross ignorance that is in the body of Christ. I apologize. Please lend me one minute. Let me press on this. This is very important. I submit to you that there is a lot of random, uncoordinated knowledge within the body of Christ. Knowledge must be sequentially arranged. You see, knowledge is like a building. The Bible calls for spiritual houses. Do you build a foundation and put a zinc on it? Just because it is required in the building, there is timing and there is sequence. It is line upon line. So most believers freelance their knowledge. They add anything upon anything and it does not equal to the glory of God. It is time for us to reset literally. Some of us may need to go back to the drawing board and begin to examine the pillars. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, six foundational doctrines that make up the believer's foundation. Six of them. Are we together now? From there it says, let's move on to perfection. There are other aspects, but first things first. It's a waste learning about prosperity where you are not saved. You've not learned about character, you are learning about money. You want to die, it will kill you. You must understand death to the flesh. Then that will profit you. Are we together now? 
you are praying for increase and you have not built capacity in the spirit, the challenges that come with that increase, you will not be able to endure. So I'm hoping and trusting and I pray that God will help all of us, including myself, men and women of God across Nigeria, Africa, in this prophetic wave of revival, that we must return to the place of doctrine. We must obtain grace to leave this celebrity Christianity and get serious with building God's people. According to Jeremiah 3.15, that we become pastors according to God's heart, who will feed God's people with knowledge and with understanding. Let me rest my case. Please rise up on your feet. Just one prayer point. Father, I obtain grace to submit myself to prayer and the ministry of the word. Please lift your voice and pray. Let it be from the depth of your heart. Where I have de-emphasized or overemphasized, I obtain grace to balance my coordinates to make sure that I am robust and sound in the ministry of prayer with fasting, intimacy with the spirit and then the ministry of the word. I submit myself to learn doctrine. I submit myself to be methodically mentored. I obtain grace from you that I would be like the lamb's wife, equal in length, equal in breadth, with no exaggerations. <laughs> 